Hello everyone, um, I'm Madeline from the marketing team at Toast and I'm delighted to welcome you to this exciting panel discussion led by author and journalist Katie Tregidden. I'd first like to say that we're very happy to be supporting the Crafts Council UK and their Let's Craft Appeal, which has been ensuring that young people across the UK don't miss out on the health, well-being and educational benefits of creativity. This is something that's really important to us, so we're really grateful for your support. Some of you may have joined us already over the last year, um, but if you're new to Toast or just to our virtual workshops, then welcome. We are delighted to have you with us. So for those who don't know, Toast is a lifestyle brand aspiring to a slower, more thoughtful way of life. And each season, we host a series of events on topics that slow us down, enrich, inspire and educate. We've always believed in the importance of timeless design. Our garments are made to last and we treat our pre-loved items as a resource to recycle rather than waste. So our aim is to foster longevity and to really support others to do the same. We at Toast we're, are on a journey um, to creating a more thoughtful way of being in the world, taking a multifaceted approach across everything that we do from the moment we start thinking about a collection um, all the way through to product lifecycle management. And you can find out more um, about our social conscience program online where you can read in detail about our commitments to both people and the planet um, in the coming years and beyond. So at Toast, we hope to educate and inspire you to make more informed choices. And I'm delighted that for the next 45 minutes or so, we are going to hear from some of the leading menders, um, researchers and designers that are at the forefront of circular thinking. So following the discussion, um, we will come to a live Q&A. Uh, so if you do have any questions throughout, please do pop them into the Q&A box um, and we'll come to those a little bit later on. Uh, but just to remind you, your webcam and microphone will be disabled for the duration of the event, um, but you can engage with us through the chat and the Q&A feature, so please do do that. Um, I look forward to engaging with you shortly, but for now, over to you, Katie. Thank you, Madeleine. And for anyone who is in the waiting room, can we just have a moment for Leon, Jean-Marie and Christine Rauter? What a beautiful, slow soundscape to kind of ground us all in the moment and sort of take us away from the distractions of the day and really, really bring us here. I really enjoyed that. It was wonderful. Um, so hello and welcome to this conversation about mending and repair. We're here to celebrate Toast Renewal, which encourages you to bring any item of Toast clothing to any store for repair. And it's an initiative that's about more, cons about more conscious consumption, sorry, um, and encouraging us to buy fewer clothes and sort of slowing down. And I think from a brand that makes its money selling clothes, that's a pretty bold statement. And I think we need more of that in the world. So I'm excited to be here to, to celebrate that initiative. Um, and there's a, there's a quote on the website that sort of prefaces the explanation of Toast Renewal that I'd love to share with you to sort of set the scene. Jessica Smulders Cohen, who is one of Toast's uh, renewal repair specialists, says mending is about the journey traveled, not reinstating the impossible perfection of the new. And I just think that's a lovely sort of thing to think about as we go into this conversation and something we will discuss, I'm sure. So some introductions. I'm Katie Tregidden, a podcaster, author of Wasted, When Trash Becomes Treasure. I've got a stack of books next to me because <laughs> we have a couple of authors with us. Um, and a journalist championing a more circular approach to design because planet Earth deserves better stories. And I really believe in the power of storytelling to change the way that people think. And I'm joined on the panel today by an incredible group of humans. Uh, dialing in from Lagos, Sital Solanke is a London-based materials designer, researcher and writer. She's the author of Why Materials Matter, the heaviest book on my pile, uh, which I highly recommend. Uh, she's the director and founder of Materials Research Studio Matter and a fellow at Hereford College of Arts. Celia Pym is a trained teacher and a trained nurse, but now works as an artist exploring damage and repair, primarily in textiles. She was shortlisted for the Women's Hour Craft Prize and her work is held in permanent collections of the Crafts Council in the UK and the Nouveau Musée National de Monaco. Bonnie Kempsky is an artist, researcher and former editor of Ceramic Review. She completed her undergraduate degree in religion before travelling to Kyoto to study the Zen Buddhist art form of the tea ceremony, where she discovered her love of ceramics. And Bonnie is the author of this book, 
I mean, you guys are going to be filling up your hopefully not Amazon baskets, bookshop.org baskets by the end of this. Uh, and this book is Kintsuki, The Poetic Mend. And Bonnie also has a PhD from the RCA. And Tom Van Dynen, otherwise known as Tom of Holland, is a Brighton-based self-taught textiles practitioner, founder of the Visible Mending Programme and a volunteer at the Brighton Repair Cafe and thinks he was probably the first person to use the hashtag visible mending on Instagram. And that hashtag now has more than 105,000 posts attached to it. So you've got some answering to do for that, I think, Tom. <laughs> Bonnie, perhaps I can come to you first, um, as I think your expertise is probably the area that viewers will be least familiar with. Can you first explain briefly what Kintsugi is? and what it means or meant within Japanese culture. Sure, sure, let's start with that. First, I'm gonna start with, start with something to look at. So this is a kintsugi mended pot. It's a traditional uh, hagi tea bowl that was broken in transport when it was sent to me and I had it kintsugi repaired. You can see the gold outline of the seams. So that's what we're talking about. So kintsugi is a Japanese repair technique. It's used for many materials, but most often used for ceramics. And it uses lacquer and gold to produce these seams that appear to be solid gold. And it takes a lot, uh, it takes fine skills, a lot highly skilled artisans to do this. And it takes a lot of time and it takes expensive materials. So it tends to be used only for those objects which are that we cherish, those objects that are important to us, either because they have high monetary value or more likely because they have a story behind them. They have, and they have more sentimental value or they connect us to something or someone. So in Japan, there is a, a, an aesthetic concept that many of you will have heard of, which is called wabi. And it, in Wabi, what, and it comes through tea ceremony and Zen Buddhism and other things, but what it is is that we develop an appreciation for the beauty that can be found in both irregularity and in imperfection. So Kintsugi very much fits into this sort of Japanese tradition, although I would say that not every Kintsugi repair is Wabi, but we need Wabi in order to be able to have Kintsugi, the acceptance of the imperfect and the acceptance of the irregular and the uniqueness of it. So I hope that, does that explain it enough to? That explains it very well to get us started. Thank you, Bonnie. And you mentioned Wabi there. And I think in the West, we've sort of clutched onto this idea of Wabi Sabi without mm. really knowing what it means. So could you perhaps pull apart those two terms for us and just give us a bit more understanding? Well, the terms are used together. They're often conflated together because they are related and interwoven to some extent. And, and I have to say that in Japan, a lot of people won't articulate these terms. They're, they're considered you know, ineffable. You can't really define them. But as we're in the West, and as I'm American by background, I'm allowed to. So what we see in tea ceremony, we sort of see Wabi as the irregular, uh, the imperfect, um, and Sabi as the worn, the, the the quality that shows the use of something, uh, something that's damaged by age, and that has a sort of an overtone of a beautiful loneliness or a beautiful almost sadness, sort of like some music, you know, which is just hauntingly beautiful, but very sad at the same time. That sort of rolled into that concept as well. Brilliant, thank you. I think that gives us a little, little bit more of a rich understanding of those terms that so often get used out of context in the West. Um, you've talked about repair as an apology. You've talked about repair as a hug. Um, and the metaphorical side of Kintsugi, again, is not something the Japanese often talk about, but you know, it's, it's sort of, it's implied. Is that something you could sort of just explain a little bit more as well before we, before we get onto the other media? Yeah, well, you, and this is the same in, in any uh, visible repair. It has a story. You can't look at it without knowing that there's something that has happened to that piece. So um, every, and that's where the metaphor comes from. So first off, Kintsugi does three things. It, it restores function. It adds beauty or decoration, and it shows a narrative. It shows that story. So one way I'll explain this. So when I was in Japan and I was asking people in doing this research, and I was asking people, 
about Kintsugi's metaphor and they all sort of just looked blankly at me and then they would tell me a story. So one was uh, we went to visit um, a very famous potter named Raku Kichizaim on the 15th. So he's the 15th generation of potters in his family going back to the 1500s. Okay, so he, uh, we went to meet with him and his wife would, brought out a bowl that was repaired uh, using silver instead of gold, Ginsugi it's called. It was called Nekawaride, which means it was broken by a cat. That's another story. So there's a whole story in that. But she told me that they had a very close friend who was a very, very wealthy businessman. And in the crash that happened in Japan a few years ago in the economic downturn, he lost everything. His business was destroyed. He lost all of his assets. Everything was gone. And they invited him over and in the tea room, they served him a bowl of tea using Nekawari Day. And a year later, he wrote to them and he said that he was at his lowest point when they had served him tea, but that in using Nekawari Day, he had realized that that brokenness could be put back together. And he said it was by thinking about that bowl and how that bowl had been put back together after it had been destroyed. And in the end, it was more beautiful more meaningful, stronger, and more valuable than it had been in its original state. So that's the, that's the metaphor that underlines every Kintsugi repair. Yeah, that's a really beautiful story. Thank you. Um, Celia, I wonder if you'd like to come in here. Your interest in mending, I know, has less to do with the, the kind of functionality of the mend and more about the stories and conversations that the damage and the process of repairing brings up. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your approach? Sure. I'm actually quite moved just hearing that story from Bonnie. I'm really startled by it. And I was thinking we could spend the next 45 minutes just telling stories about <laughs> less than perfect things we've encountered. Um, but to answer your question about, you know, my interest is often in the, the story rather than doing something practical uh, when I mend garments and I've been mending clothing in my own expert way, when I say that, I mean that I've largely taught myself um, over the last 14 years. I'm much more interested in mending other people's things than mending my own things. People often say to me, oh, have, do you wear your mended clothes out? I really don't. I, I'm much more excited about other people's stuff than my own. And early on when I started doing this, I sort of, when I first became curious about damaged clothing, and it was exactly as Bonnie described. I, I lean towards liking the imperfect. I've always been attracted to the slightly damaged off thing. And so when I started thinking about how that might marry with repair and mending, I was like, I have to become an expert in holes. Like I have to really know holes. If I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna go all out. And I would hold these events where I would just invite people to bring me damaged goods. And what I discovered very quickly was that if you ask someone, do you have a hole in your clothing? You very swiftly discover an awful lot about a person that you weren't expecting to learn. You learn who their relative is, how the thing got damaged. You learn about maybe someone who's important to them who's died. And I was like, I'm onto something here because I'm fundamentally quite a nosy person. I'm always, if I'm on a bus, the person who wants to talk to my neighbor or if I'm, you know, someone falls over, I want to run and help them because I, well, and then all of a sudden you're talking. Anyway, my point is, is that I was very excited and moved to discover that clothing and this invitation to repair clothing would invite all this conversation. And I actually thought a lot of the stories, it's interesting, Bonnie sort of described quite a sad story in a way, or positive and sad that the, the businessman who came to the tea ceremony was in at a low ebb. He was having a hard time because I found that quite often that when I've held events, open events, asking people to bring me things to mend, there are mixed in quite often quite sad stories. There's something about looking at the damaged garment that provokes and there's a sort of reaching out. And I remember one woman saying, um, who brought me an item that had belonged to someone she loved who just recently died. She said, I think my friends are tired of me talking about my grief. And I said, uh, I didn't say anything, but I thought, you know, there is that ease to talk about sad things with strangers sometimes. Mm. I've experienced it myself. And, 
And so, I don't know, I've gone off in a bit of a segue here, but I know that I like other people's stuff. No, no, I think that, that's really beautiful. And you've actually collaborated with Toast <coughs> for these workshops in the past, haven't you? That's right. We did a wonderful, so Toast it was such a perfect marriage for me. So we did a project which I called I Have Sharp Elbows, But My Needle Is Sharper, where we did what I have done in the past. We invited people that own Toast clothing to bring in items to me in need of amend. And... Um, I offered, we had a short conversation about the garment and I said, if you're keen to participate, I'll mend your object. I mean, it was very generous by Toast because the mend was for free. And the idea was this exchange um, that they would tell me a kind of history of the garment that I would then write up. And I was very curious about, I sort of saw these Toast items that I mended as a kind of family of sweaters because they'd all originated in this same place by the similar designers and then they left and gone out in the world and got burnt and torn by blackberry bushes and stretched out of shape by children and moth eaten and all these sort of not very dramatic damage actually quite humble simple damage cats were involved I think with one person <laughs> but the, the this act of noticing that I thought was so nice. And I, I liked seeing it noticed as a group as well, a very similar garment. So yes, we did that with, and it was called I Have Sharp Elbows, But My Needle Is Sharper slash men project, because one of the participants said, I have sharp elbows and always that left elbow or right elbow, I can't remember now, goes. And I felt there was something restorative about the needle. It was like, you may have a sharp elbow, but don't worry, I got this sharp needle. Yeah. And um, yeah. That's lovely. I like that. Now, Sita, within the context of Toast, we're obviously talking about really high quality clothing. And a lot of these men's are objects that, you know, we care about. They have sentimental value. But the, the sort of imperative to mending is, is really an antithesis of the sort of fast fashion problem. You know, clothes that are made largely in the global south shipped up to the global north where we wear them a few times and then effectively send them back again why is that cycle so problematic why is it important that we break out of that um so many reasons and i think a lot of it really comes down to the fact that we don't really care or respect um these textiles even um and the clothing that they become and how they actually adorn our bodies. And because we haven't really formed a relationship to those pieces of clothing in a way where we build a relationship towards care and respect, mm -hmm. um, because we actually don't know where it's, they have derived from because the supply chain of a lot of the textiles being made for clothing is really convoluted and complicated and, um, deceitful also I would say so it's really quite challenging to kind of therefore understand where things are being made how they're being made and where they end up even so we're so disconnected and so far removed from what things are made of simply and therefore that kind of relationship and this actually comes back to the storytelling component, which is what the first part of this conversation has been about. And clothing tells stories um, very much about, yeah, Celia, what Celia Pym does, she's very much about telling stories about clothing or fabric or um, yarn even, and like what, how it can be rebirthed somehow. Mm. Um, and tell a, another story, uh, someone else's story even. And I think um, textiles have the ability to do that, but we don't understand that story enough. And what happens is it, these clothing, the clothing actually uh, cycle begins to be even more complicated when we dispose of it because it tells a colonial story, I think, mm. because um, the way everything is being made and manufactured, it's going back to colonial history um, because, every, like you said earlier, things are manufactured 
interested in, say, the global south shipped to the global north, but then actually disposed of in the global south again, or dumped, should I say. And I think that's incredibly problematic because we're not really taking accountability or responsibility for our actions. Mm. And that is really down to the fact that we don't really care or respect for it. We just dispose of it at our leisure. And we don't really have the transparency around like what happens to these items that we actually own. But I think it really does come down to the fact that we need to relate to materials and form a relationship towards them. And that can only really come through, brand, I mean, like brands like Toast, for example, they tell stories about their clothing and where it comes from and very conscious about that. And I think building awareness in that way is really, really crucial for that kind of relationship towards care and respect to occur. Um, so, yeah, I think a lot of that needs to change and it's not just a colonial problem. Um, history that needs to be shifted, uh, the narrative around it, the systems around it. Um, it's a systemic issue, but that's also a behavioral issue, right? Mm. So it can be done through a bottom-up approach, but also top-down. So I think there's policy in change involved, but there's also just human behavior mm. that can actually be shifted. And I think you make a really important point because I've spent a long time thinking about the power of stories you know, the, the little strapline I use for my work is planet Earth deserves better stories, but I hadn't thought of it in the way you just articulated it before, which is the danger when those stories become hidden. So the fact that we don't know where our clothes are made and we don't know who's made them, that the supply chain is, is deceitful and, and complex. And the fact that we then don't know or care where our clothes go, there are parts of that story that are being suppressed. And that's almost as dangerous as the power of the positive stories. So that's that's a really useful reframe. Thank you, Sital. Um, Tom, you approach you describe your approach to mending as more pragmatic. You're more interested in a, a functional and sustainable mend than an artistic one. Although you do talk about wearing a darn as a badge of honor. So I'd love you just to unpick that for us a little bit and explain a little bit more about your work. So um, yeah, that's <laughs> I, I do favor a a pragmatic and practical approach to mending um, but you know that it, it's been highlighted I think already by all the other panelists the stories behind what you're repairing are very interesting and you know I also hear a lot of stories around clothes and I've, I, I really enjoy that part of of repairing and um, <laughs> I, I, for me personally, I think um, a repair is successful mostly if it's if it means that the people who ask me to repair it or my for my own clothes that they will wear it again, as opposed to I've got the sweater I really like. Can you fix it? And then I, I fix it and it's really beautiful, but they're then scared of wearing it. It kind of feels like I somehow failed a little bit in my in my. Uh, repair um but i do feel um i, I think it's because I, I when i started repairing i i really wanted to try and do invisible mending and that turns out to be very difficult <laughs> um you know and you know if it's visible anyway um why not really look at take that as a as a starting point and make it a feature and i think um by Doing a visible repair, um, one, you can build up a relationship with that item. You know, people that make their own clothes already have a relationship with whatever, uh, you know, the article that they've made. You know, you have to look for pattern and you find your fabrics or your, your knitting yarn. So you're really invested in that item. And I think with shop bought clothes, you might not have that initially, but there might be something that, that attracts you to it. And, then by adding your own repairs to it or, or ask somebody else to do it for you, then it becomes a more unique item and you, you start building that relationship um, and make it stronger. And hopefully that means then you want to wear it for longer as well and keep it in active use, because I think that's really um, important if we want to work on um, <coughs> you know, this circular economy and um, 
do something uh, about fast fashion, then the, one of the, the most important things I think is the clothes you already own are the most sustainable ones that you can have. So, yeah. you know, make those last is really important, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think you can reduce the environmental impact of an item of clothing by 30% if you extend its lifespan by nine months. Yeah, I yeah, it's quite remarkable. Way. Yeah, so it's kind remarkable of, numbers. Absolutely. Now you're behind the visible mending hashtag, which is a phenomenon. I mean, hundreds of thousands of men's worldwide. Um, and Toast's own Toast Time to Make hashtag has been gaining momentum this year with all the visible, uh, with all the virtual workshops and things that have been happening. Now I'm interested in kind of whether there's a danger in this becoming trendy and therefore a trend and the kind of the fine line between mending because I think you know there are some there are instances um of sort of people having something mended that wasn't broken because they want a mend and they kind of want to be part of the gang but actually you talk about the idea of mending the plainness of a garment and mending techniques being used as a form of embellishment so I'm really interested to explore that a little bit yeah, <laughs> it's a long, long question. That's a very long question, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so well, I, was, I think, first of all, the, the visible mending hashtag, you know, I, I'm sure I wasn't the only person, but I, I, I do think I was one of the first people to use it um, consistently on the Instagram before it's, you know, started to go through the world. And it's very exciting to see how many people use it because it's, uh, it's a great way of... Um, getting people to, sorry, there's something happening on my screen. Um, it's a great way uh, for people to share inspiration and for people to find inspiration. Um, and um, <coughs> the, so I think that's kind of one part of your question. And then um, I, I find repairs really beautiful and I think, you know, talking, hearing Bonnie about um, talking about Kintsugi and Celia about mending and stories and, and uh, highlighting the repairs and also Sita saying, you know, it's, it's good to have connections and not try to hide things. Um, I, I find the, the, the stitches used and the techniques used uh, beautiful in itself and um, even if they are not traditionally um, embellishment techniques, I, I do think there is a way that you can start using them as a sort of embellishment. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm not such a fan of making something fake old, which I've been asked to do previously as well. Now that doesn't feel right to me. You know, if, if something needs mending, it really needs. You know, in my mind, it does need to have something wrong with it. It needs to be broken. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't use mending techniques as a sort of embellishment technique. And um, <clears throat> I started exploring that about uh, a year or so ago with an exhibition in Norway where I made a, a, some kind of uh, wall hanging that I wanted to take the, the stitches or the, the mending techniques away from the clothes and ask people to appreciate them in their own merit. And um, I was really excited when Toast uh, approached me and used that one of their um, talking points to see if we could have some kind of collaboration. Um, so I'm really excited to say that um, I am working on a, a mini collection <laughs> uh, with Toast where I do, where we are exploring exactly that, you know, not necessarily repairing things, although there will be some actual repairs involved as well, but also, you know, how can you use it as an embellishment technique? And I think it would be nice. Um, what I'd like to see happen is people embrace mended things more. So, you know, maybe in, in this particular collaboration, it might be more about, you know, it's, it's more as an embellishment. But if we start appreciating that, then hopefully people also start appreciating actual men's and it will no longer be seen as something, you know, outrageous perhaps even or, or, or look down upon um, so yeah so fake mending I'm personally not such a fan of um, like I, I don't like it um, people that come to me and say oh I've got these jeans that I bought with holes in them can you fix them now 
and you know that <clears throat> it's like well why would you buy jeans with holes in to start with like that's something that i still to clarify, we're that talking I... about new jeans here right yeah yeah, yeah, new jeans. Yes. yeah 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 it's a strange no, no. phenomenon and also the processes by which those holes are put into those jeans are not great for the environment are they so no, and there's, the a, there's a lot of problems that, there that um Celia, I know you've also had requests for men's where there wasn't necessarily a hole, which I'd love you to, to talk about. And also just then when Tom was talking about taking the mending techniques away from the clothes, it made me think of the, the mending map that you made. So maybe you could talk about those two things briefly. Oh, so I've, um, there's so much to think, it's so, sorry, it's so funny on Zoom. I wanna to respond to everyone's conversation as we go and leap in, because I loved what Sita was talking about. Maybe we can get to that a little later. In response to your question, I have mended things, not very often, but occasionally that have no particular damage. And one example I can think of was for the project I did with Toast. A woman came to me who said, I love Toast sweaters but I love them so much. She may even be here tonight, I don't know. I love them so much, I take really good care of them and I don't wear them very much. And I said, well, I can't really help you <laughs> because <laughs> they haven't got any holes in them. And she said, oh, there must be something we can, we can do. And, and, and so, I mean, what I think is interesting is that actually we then got into a sort of longer conversation about her clothing and being careful with clothing and really, the invitation, she wanted to participate in the conversation and not so much the need to mend something. Right. I think actually sometimes, you know, Cetel brought up this idea of building a relationship of care and respect with, garm with, with materials, so the cloth of your clothing, with the clothing itself. I felt that was what was being said. And um, she, she wanted to have, she had these feelings about her clothes that she wanted to discuss, but and lots of people do have clothing that gets a bit stuck in their life sometimes. They neither want to keep wearing nor throw away, sort of sits in a quiet space in their wardrobe, doesn't get seen a lot. And so I feel like I've seen a lot of items like that that are not necessarily in need of mending, but are somehow sort of stuck somewhere. Anyway, in the end, we decided actually that maybe there was the potential for future damage in the elbows and so I did, in fact, reinforce the elbows of this garment. Even though there wasn't damage right there, we were anticipating the, the, the damage for the way this person would wear that. And that was the way of resolving that situation. Yeah, I think it's fascinating, though, isn't it? That an item of clothing might not necessarily need a repair, but it might need something. It might need some love or a, a reframe or an embellishment, or and that enables it to, to be worn again and kind of go back into into that use cycle which is in interesting bonnie does this happen in kintsugi do you find people breaking ceramics just so they can mend them with beautiful golden joints yes it does <laughs> <laughs> it's not very much in the spirit of kintsugi i have to say um, at the same time that's not to say that breakage can't be important and be properly employed so if you look for instance at the artwork of claudia claire who's a contemporary ceramicist and feminist artist. <clears throat> she uses the, the drama and the violence of breaking her work to represent the, uh, the violence that many women around the world experience in their own homes. So she's making a statement by, through that breaking. Mm. But it's different if you just take a pot that has not a lot of, not a lot going for it and you just smash it so that you can stick it back together <clears throat> using gold. I think that part of what that comes from is Kintsugi, like many, many things, is really, it can be a fad. Let's, put, let's be honest, it can be a fad. And I think that's what we see when it's just fashion with no nothing underneath it. But Kintsugi is actually a way of life, just like this all the mending that we've been talking about here it's a way of life it's a sustainable way of life and a beautiful way of life not just a fashion that's going to be over next year this is long term a long term approach in a way to establish and, and strengthen and reinforce that relationship that we have with the objects that are important to us mm. yeah yeah and i think that's a really important point um 
if anybody has got questions, I've got three more questions for the panel, but if you're sitting in the audience watching and, and thinking, oh, I'm, I must type a question into the Q&A box, do it now, uh, and then we'll have them all in there by the time I, I finish with, with my questions. Um, Sital, are there materials innovations that might help here? Are there sort of self-healing materials or self-destructing materials? Do, you know, do we always need to have this relationship of a break and then amend or, or other sort of new things on the horizon that might change that relationship? Yeah, there's many um, material developments that we already have, as well as perhaps new innovations um, that are due to be released commercially. But maybe I will start with the premise of not everything needs to be repaired, actually. Um, mm -hmm. And not all materials are meant to be, um, yeah, living long, really. Mm -hmm. not, not all materials will have a long lifespan. And I think that really stems down to the fact that there are materials that are meant to naturally biodegrade and that's actually okay. Mm. And we need to be more accepting of the fact that things die. Everything has a, a, a birth, a life, a death and a rebirth. And that exists within material world, human world, animal world, plant world. It's, it's just, we are so fixated on the fact that everything has to be long living. Mm. And I think there's a sense of renewal that needs to be kind of um, understood a bit more. And that really comes down to this cyclical, the natural cycles of materials as well that we need to kind of address rather than forcing a material to kind of do something that maybe it's not meant to be doing. Mm. And um, yeah, I think that really comes down to the fact that we don't understand materials enough, mm. but there are materials that are being addressed as like self-healing or naturally antibacterial, naturally an antimicrobial. And e that even exists with fibers like nettle, for example, or bamboo, um, you know, things that are actually already existing. Um, and I think not, we need to pay attention to what we already have available to us and not always think about the newness of things as well. And it's so about perhaps thinking when designers are sort of creating garments or objects already thinking about the end of life and whether they can be repaired, whether they can go back into natural systems and biodegrade and sort of thinking of making those end of life decisions at the beginning of, a, of an object's life. Totally. I think we really need to bring in end of life as a as part of the design process. Mm -hmm. And we as designers need to be responsible for end of life. And therefore, there's an accountability there. And yeah, who's accountable for it? Is there a material will that we need to address in this, you know? Um, so that's something that I would, I'm hoping to work on at some point. But yeah, I think not all materials are meant to live long. Yeah, and I think that's a really important, um, again, shift in perspective. And what we're asking for, sort of in response to the environmental crisis, is a huge series of shifts in perspective and shifts in behaviour, both as we've discussed, kind of at a systemic level and personal level. How can mending and some of these other conversations about materials start to nudge us towards some of those shifts? Um, so shift in behavior really is about a shift in narrative first. And I think that really has to happen with our role as creatives and how we present things. Mm -hmm. um, and aesthetics are a really big part of that, I would say. And I think changing the narrative around what sustainable fashion is um, ha has really happened. And, you know, we're not seeing like jute sacks being worn as, you know, uh, pieces of clothing in the way that it was perhaps in the 60s. Um, it's a very different aesthetic um, and maybe more appealing to people because what happens is it looks familiar, but it's made from something unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that encourages curiosity and questioning ultimately, which means that people are wanting to learn ultimately. And if they're wanting to learn, that means they're wanting to understand what things are made of, or at least ask a few questions around it. And I think if that starts to trigger things and they, a whole world is opening up there. So um, there's just so much to learn. I will never know everything about materials ever. And I will never claim to even feel like an expert in it because I think I'm always a student in it. Mm -hmm. um, they are way smarter than I am and will ever be. Um, so there's always this kind of ongoing exchange and engagement of um, learning about each other, much like human relationships. So um, yeah, I think there's just a change in narrative needs to happen first, which informs behavioral change and then informs systems change. Mm -hmm. So it has this kind of knock on effect and it, it is quite cyclical as well because once those systems have been changed, we might need to go back to a narrative change. Mm. So there's a kind of feedback loop that happens. And I think that sense of what you were talking about, about you learning from materials and having that dialogue with materials, there's a sense that sort of humans use materials, whereas you talk about materials very much as being on the same plane as humans and being in dialogue with one another. And I think that's a really interesting perspective shift as well not just for materials but you know for the for the world and the environment and you know the sort of planet that we live on in in general to kind of not just treat these things as resources but to to encourage that dialogue um Celia I know you wanted the opportunity to respond to some of what Cetel has been saying so I'm going to give you the the last question from me um there's an imaginative shift required here as well as a, a sort of functional behavioral shift. And I, and I love some of the, the things that you've sort of talked about in terms of the magic of, of mending and how that, that imaginative shift can take place. So perhaps you could sort of mention some of that and, and respond to what Cetel said. Oh, um, I definitely am caught up. I, I find that a story of something of an event, of a, especially if it is a story that stirs up emotion, uh -huh. lives in my imagination for much longer than facts. <laughs> they don't stay, personally, they don't stay with me in the same way. Whereas mm -hmm. there is a magic to stories and um, your response to aesthetics and to, to, to things that live in you in a different way and that there's a real power in that. And so sometimes I think the power of mending something is not actually, for me, necessarily telling everyone to mend everything. It's planting this seed of an idea that there's beauty in this act or in this material or in this thing. Because actually, for me, I know that wool, for instance, is a material that I have a great affinity for and I really love mending. But one of the reasons I love mending wool is because it wears down in a way that I really love. I mean, I think if I'd had the chance to work in ceramics, I mean, I've had the chance to work in ceramics, but if I'd chosen the path of ceramics, I might feel that way about ceramics. But with wool, one of the things I adore is you can have the thinnest remnants of a fibre that you can sort of stitch back into an old fibre. You can keep the very most fragile traces of a sweater intact by adding more wool in and you can keep repairing something i was thinking about this sort of end of life conversation those i have this fantasy that there may be objects that i mend for a hundred years if i live for a hundred years and that the original there whether the original traces of that thing would still exist in that object or garment down the line but that this act of repair is sort of with that particularity of wool materials is this constant shape shifting and softening and changing but it begins with this essence of the first garment so yeah I think that there is a strength in narrative and a power in narrative and storytelling oral history storytelling to to fix in our imaginations so that messages or ideas spread mm. and I don't think they need to be true stories either they can be myths about a garment or a thing or an object when I think about it for myself. Yeah, um, but I want 
job, sweet Al. I want to be the one. You said, who's accountable for the end of life decisions about materials? I want that job. I want to be the decision maker about end of <laughs> I want to have a department of end of life and the end of life department for maybe I'll start with wool and then other other categories can come in. <laughs> Brilliant. We'll send your old clothes to Celia. To Celia. <laughs> yeah. I think I think that's really lovely. And I think it's important, um, you know, that, that it's not just individuals mending their own clothes, but, you know, brands like Toast with Toast Renewal kind of amplifying that story and using their platforms to tell those stories on a wider level. So um, thank you so much for that, guys. That's all of my questions. I'm going to hand back over to Madeline, who's going to curate some of the best questions from the Q&A and the, the chat and share those with us. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Firstly, thank you so much. Um, a really um, interesting conversation and thank you to everybody for sending in um, such thoughtful questions. There's a lot there um, and we're gonna try and get to as many as we can, um, but thank you so much for sending them in. Uh, there's one I'd love to start with, um, which is around this idea of people wanting to participate in conversations by breaking what's not broken, mending where there are no holes. And um, maybe that actually speaks to a deeper need to create care and relationships with their belongings. And do you think that this is actually a possibility? Could you, sorry, could you just break it down? So the question was that people desire to add repair or mending where there is none. And they were wondering if that, could you just repeat the question? Sorry, yeah, so it's whether, it's, it's sort of speaking about a deeper need for care and connection with their belongings and um, because they're wanting to take part in the conversation. So do you think it, it is possible um, to create this deeper connection? I'm happy to start if nobody mm -hmm. else minds. Yeah, um, my, yep. <laughs> <laughs> my thought and response to that is there's a wonderful book that I, I refer to a lot by Vladimir Arkipov called Homemade. And um, it's about sort of mended and homemade objects from Soviet Union. And um, I think the more you mess around with things you own, and what I mean by that is that you play with them, touch them, no notice, observe when they start to age or change, the more you'll build up a material vocabulary and language and, and knowledge. I don't mean words, I mean, like your fingers will know how to hold something or pull something or stretch something that, that what you're trying to do is build your material knowledge of the world. And that is through, so it's about noticing which is your favorite mug and thinking, why does that mug sit in my hand just right? Or why does this garment, why does the color of this garment make me feel so phenomenal and amazing or the drape or the handle of it? And so something that I advocate really strongly for is a sort of material knowledge. So it's not that you need to break it or care for it before it's broken, though there's plenty of care and material care you can do, but what you're really aiming for is to notice the materials and the damage and the things so that you're starting to observe and understand in your body as well as in your brain what you love about the material world that you've built around you and why you choose the formica table or the I don't know the stone floor or the or why you love a house with bricks versus a house with wood floors or something I don't know I think, I think this that's where I'd start I think there's also something that, that springs to mind. I wrote my dissertation uh, for the masters I did relatively recently on various different sorts of mending, but I compared make do and mend with the contemporary visible mending movement. And I compared borrow and sashiko in Japan with the shoddy industry, which is currently how we process a lot of waste textiles. And one of the things I found was that the, the reasons we mend have changed. So it used to be that we mended out of poverty and need and things were garments particularly were mended because that was the only one we had and it was broken so it had to be mended and there's a lot of shame that comes with that and um i think it can be slightly problematic when we kind of directly appropriate those techniques and kind of use them in a different context um but there are new imperatives for mending. So it's very rare that we mend an item of clothing now because it's our only one and we need to wear it. You know, usually it's because 
we love it or because we care about the environment or because we want to respect the person who made that for us or and so I think the, the imperatives to mend are changing but that doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't mend so I, I think kind of I'm not necessarily advocating breaking things just to mend them but I think as Celia says the more you you know, think of, it as, think of it as hacking. There's a whole hacking movement, right? Where we take something that doesn't quite work for us and we change it in some way. And I think that's really empowering because, you know, at the moment, so many of us are in a position where we're consumers. And if we don't quite like something about a garment, our option is to send it back and, and wait for the powers to be to decide whether or not we'll get a refund or a replacement or a different size or whatever it is. Whereas if we can have the kind of agency to to hack items and say actually I want it a bit more like this and maybe if I just did that I think that's tremendously powerful and I think that starts to make us citizens rather than consumers and there's then a whole chain of events that can come from that that can start to tackle some of the systemic stuff so yeah I think it's not necessarily as black and white as kind of do or don't mend for different reasons. <laughs> Has anyone else got any thoughts on that? Yeah I uh, <clears throat> we spoke about this uh, previously Katie uh, um, I, I struggle a little bit when people call my work the new make, do and mend, because I, you know, I, I do know about um, that was initially a campaign from the British government during the Second World War, trying to preserve materials towards the war effort. And, you know, that's, I, I'm not concerned about that. And that's not why I'm mending. So I just find it a little bit, um, yeah, I always find it a little bit strange to call that the new make do and mend because I'm not making do, I'm choosing to mend. I think it's a bit different. Although, you know, the techniques that they advocated, I do use a lot of those techniques in a different way than they would anticipate. You know, <clears throat> in the past, it was always usually very important that things were repaired invisibly. Um, you know, something that... Um, Jessica has written, I believe, for the Toast Renewal um, blog or website. Um, so yeah, and I think um, <clears throat> for me, I also sometimes feel um, if you don't like an item of clothing and it's kind of stuck, as Celia said, and you can do something with it, whether that's, you know, you might dye it or you might embroider something on it, in some way that's also mending I feel, um, because it means that you then might start wearing it again and restore the function of that object. I think that's right. If the, if the function is lost because you no longer want to wear it, then a repair will be, a, will make it functional again. Yeah, even if it's not a, you know, fixing a hole, it's still repairing the function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's also something to be said around um, who decides when something's broken. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's something we need to kind of be more aware of, like the voices of like what's broken and how do we fix things. And I, I even don't like the word fix because it means it's a solution and it doesn't, it's fixed and it doesn't have this kind of evolution of growth or change and um yeah it feels very static and rigid and therefore doesn't have its own life and and to breathe really and so i think what's quite interesting with things that are deemed to be damaged or broken there can be a new life for it and maybe it's non-functional actually and I think there's a sense of, you know, um, a new life for it in that way. And like, maybe what we need to also do is change our perspective on like what is deemed to be broken um, as well. So I think we have to almost go back to being more imaginative and something that you mentioned earlier, Katie. And I think our imagination is something that we're not really tapping into as much because we're living a life of convenience mm -hmm. and therefore we're being told how to live rather than questioning how we want to live. Mm. Um, so, yeah. And um, I think purely from a sustainability point of view, the second tenet of the circular economy is to keep materials and objects in use, not just to keep objects in use. So sometimes when the functionality of that object is 
kind of not fixable, it's fine to take those materials and, and do something else with them, right? Exactly. And there's a different use for it. And therefore, it, that material is reaching another potential, which is incredible. Mm. And all materials are really versatile. So let's embrace that more. Yeah, I just, sorry, Celia. No, no, go ahead, Tom. I just want to respond to that. I find that, um, because I think there's, there's one um, area in fashion where um, used items or encouraging um, <coughs> used looks is really celebrated. And that's uh, in the denim heads world. You know, some people are really into the denim and they really value, you know, they don't wash them for months and they really work hard to get all the, the holes in that the authentic holes through use. And I've, so, that, you know, in some areas there is an acceptance there. And um, also talking about reusing garments in a different way than, um, you know, making them wearable again. Um, I can't quite remember now uh, what um, brand it is, but there is a um, furniture brand that uh, got the, I think they're the Burlec brothers. They made these uh, chairs and they're basically they're just bundles of, um, of waist um, clothes just tied together into the shape of a, of a chair. So that, you know, that there are some examples to be found out already, which show the possibilities. It's, it's really exciting to, uh, to try and explore that further, I think. Yeah, I think it was by Droog Design. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A, I was there's... just going to tell a story. Sorry, Katie, you can go ahead. I was just going to say really quickly, because it relates to, to what Tom was just saying, is there's a wonderful quote by Kate Fletcher, who's an amazing academic in this space. And she talks about how clothes, the moment you buy them, rather than being the sort of pinnacle of perfection, are actually a blank canvas. And it's only when you start to, to wear them and put the creases into the elbows and the creases into the hips that they become imbued with life. And I think that's a really lovely way to look at clothing. And certainly denim jeans is, is the, way, the place that that's seen most most vividly, I think. Sorry, Celia, go ahead. No, I was just, it was sort of in response to Tal and Tom and that lovely quote. I got invited once to, to look at an archive of costumes, silk costumes that had been worn on the ballet for about 100 years old, 100 to 60 years old. And they'd invited me to think about, they, well, they were very open-ended, the museum. They wanted me to look at the archive and they, but I think they thought I would recommend repairing them and that I would do it in a certain way. And I kept looking at these costumes in this archive um, and I was so excited to even have this privileged access to this archive and I kept thinking not a lot of people get to go behind the scenes in a museum and see these extraordinary things and what was funny the silk had all rotted it had aged and the metal sequins were sort of holding the skeleton of bits of silk together so you could kind of still make out the costumes and I went away and thought about it and they said, what do you want to do with these? And I thought about it and all I could come up with at the time was I want more people to see these things, not necessarily to mend them. And I also thought mending them will take me years and be way too big a task and it's not worth their money or anyone's energy. And so what we decided on in the end, I, I said, what if we, they were designed for performance. So why don't we take them out and let people perform in them again and we'll we'll dance in them until they're complete dust. And so we held these events where you could wear these fragments of costume and these sort of skeletal costumes and we danced and we danced and we danced and we sort of everyone put on, we made playlists. I mean, there was a whole structure to it. And it was one of the best piece of work. I, I was such an exciting piece of work to do. And it it's recorded in photographs, but not much else. Um, the difficulty was is that we, of course, nothing turns to dust from dancing. The, the sequence still held in place. And now those are preserved in the archive as something special. So then, this, you know, my idea was that we'd have nothing at the end. But of course, some of the material lasted and went back into the collection and became more precious, weirdly, as a result of this very active, non-precious activity with the costumes. That's a wonderful so story. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Celia. Madeline, do we have time for any more questions or have we talked for far too long on the first one? <laughs> well, we are really, really near to the end, but I suppose I would, 
I'd quite like to ask this one um, to you all, whether you think that there are parallels um, repairing material objects and our international recovery um, from COVID? That's a good question. I'm definitely not going to go first. Who wants to take that one first? <laughs> Gosh. Wow. Um, yeah, go ahead, Bonnie. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think because the, the because of the metaphor. I mean, a metaphor is actually a good metaphor is transformative. It's not just something that's out there. It's not just a English trope. It's actually a transformative thing. So if you see things that are mended things that are repaired things that are made more beautiful i think it 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 somehow moves us to do that we know that we can recover we know that not only that but we know that we should make it better so when we make that repair we should make what was better we don't, shouldn't go back to what it was it'll never be as good as new again because we don't want it to be either do we we want it to be actually better so yeah i think it does personally I think I can think, of, I'm not quite sure how this answers the question, but this comes to mind. There is a wonderful question, a wonderful company down in Cornwall where I'm based called Waterhall, and they make litter pickers, but they make litter pickers from litter. So they're currently collecting all their little disposable masks that we've all been wearing during the pandemic, collecting them all up and turning them into litter pickers with which you can pick up more masks. And there's something about that that just makes me think there's a way to to sort of use repair and, and remaking as a solution. Thank you. I think that is a lovely, a lovely place to end. I wish I could go through all of the questions. We've had so many really, really good ones. Um, so thank you all for being so engaged and um, for staying in, and and joining us it's been a joy to listen to you all i could probably talk to each and every one of you for hours to be honest um and listen to all of your stories and learn more um about what you do but thank you to everybody for joining us thank you katie for um for leading this discussion it's been lovely um and for those who are interested um in renewal um if you have any questions on it please don't hesitate to get in touch um please do head to your local store um if you are near one um, and do talk to um our our community about it we would love to we would love to hear from you so thank you all so much um, if you do have any further comments or questions we're going to leave this running just for a couple of couple more minutes um, and if there's any any pressing questions then please don't hesitate to get in touch we always love to hear from you um, so thank you all so much and i hope to see you again soon thank you thank you thank you thank you